Okay, so my problem is that I don't know who you are, um, and I don't know what you know. Presumably, you know some of you know a bit more now than you did on Saturday night, um, uh, maybe. Uh, but uh, and this isn't going to change anything existentially, or uh, but it may change my behaviour intentionally. Could it, could you just tell me? Could you just raise your hand if you have some familiarity with Martin Lerf type theory? Oh, cool. Okay, good. Thank you. So let's proceed. Um, so I'm, I'm going to be talking about, uh, as it says, models of univalence in toposes. Uh, so we're going to be talking about universes, uh, universes of types. So I'll begin just by, by uh, recalling, I hope, uh, to you the idea of a, of a universe object uh, in, uh, in a topos and uh, its relationship to, to, to the one in type theory. And then I want to discuss this so-called axiom of univalence um, that uh, the late Vladimir Vavodsky uh, put forward. So it's an extensionality principle uh, for, for universes. And uh, to do that, we have to discuss a little bit about uh, the nature of equality uh, in type theory, and in particular identity types. And uh, I'll be constructing uh, suitable instances of identity types uh, from an interval object in, uh, in, in a topos. So there is some <laughs> very slight connection with the previous talk in the sense that I will be talking about toposes and I will be talking about intervals. Uh, but you'll see that probably that's about as far as it goes. Uh, but I leave that to judge. And um, uh, I want to sketch to you uh, the current state of the art, as it were, uh, as far as making a, a universe with this rather nice exten uh, extensionality property called univalence by, by starting with an interval which is uh, uh, tiny. Um, so Bill Lorvier introduced the concept, he called it atomic, but that's a very overused word. So subsequently it got rebranded as the notion of tininess. And we'll see that tiny intervals can, can give us univalent uh, universes modulo some other assumptions, and then I'll, I'll conclude. So we're talking about universes in the sense of type theory. So a universe in type theory is a type whose elements denote types. Okay, so a type of types in some way. Uh, and they're absolutely crucial for, for Martin Lerf type theory in the sense that, that uh, without universes, Martin Lerf type theory is a very weak, logically very weak system. And with universes, you're able to express uh, um, uh, much more. Um, and when you give the semantics to type theory, say in a topos, then uh, a, a universe of types is going to be interpreted as some universe object. And uh, so I'm just going to recall and introduce the notation I'll, I'll use for that. So a universe object, um, I suppose this doesn't have a, yeah, is that? Oh yeah, excellent, yeah. So, um, so we're in some topos, okay, and we have an object U and displayed over it, in other words, uh, there's a morphism into it uh, uh, from, from some other object. And we think of that as, as displaying uh, the family of, of, of objects, uh, internal objects, if you like, in indexed by the elements of U. Of course, we're in some arbitrary topos. It doesn't actually have elements in a set theoretic sense, but it has generalized elements. Okay, so, it, so if I look at, at a, an element of U at some stage gamma, so that's just a morphism into to U from, from some other object gamma, I can see what object in the universe is, is um, coded, as we'll say, by, by this generalized element u, and that's just given by pullback. And, uh, and I'll write the pullback as, as EL of u, so the elements of u, as it were. So that's an object at stage gamma, so something in the, the slice topos, uh, E sliced over gamma, obtained by pulling back. So every time you have an element of u, uh, P, this P gives you uh, the corresponding uh, object. Okay, and I'll talk about you as being a code for, for that object. Okay, so um, universes are very often described or, or used, especially from a set theoretic point of view, because you have some idea of wanting to restrain the size of things, so you collect things of a certain size in, into a universe. 
And early on, uh, I guess um, in this context, it's, it's always good to mention uh, Jean Benabou, uh, who, who uh, thought a lot about uh, uh, families and, and, and universities very early on, uh, but didn't actually publish uh, very much of it formally. Uh, but uh, but uh, I think he was aware of the fact that if you have some notion of size in your ambient set theory, suppose you have a growth and deep universe, so that just means a set of sets that's closed under various set theoretic operations, so it gives you a notion of smallness, if you like. Then uh, if you have some uh, growth and deep topos over that notion of, 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 of set theory, uh, you, can, you can induce inside the, the topos of sheaves uh, a universe of sheaves of that size, as it were, or m more generally, families of sheaves who, whose fibers are, are of that size. Okay, and this is uh, kind of popularized by Hoffman and Streicher in, in, a, in, a, in a paper, I suppose, in the 90s, I guess. So um, I want to, um, I'm going to be working not in Grosendieck toposes, but generally speaking in an elementary topos. Uh, but I do want to have, uh, and it's crucial for what we do, to have uh, uh, the, the, the elementary topos comes uh, with a, a reasonably uh, rich notion of different sizes. So I'm just going to assume throughout that we're talking about a topos, an elementary topos, that comes with a sequence of internal universes. So these S's are like the U on the previous slide. And they're nested in the sense that, that uh, universe at level N uh, has a code in universe at level n plus one, and the universe objects are closed under, under uh, uh, pretty much everything that one might want from a topos theoretic point of view. So they'd be internal full subtoposes and closed undertaking dependent products, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I, I'm just not going to, to uh, go into the details of all that because we have uh, more important things to think about. Okay, so so so. Um, we have a topos and it's got this, these universes with notions of size, but, but size isn't the only important thing uh, about universes, okay? So, so uh, the, th the thing that we're going to, to focus on is, is the question of extensionality. So in general, if I say I have an extensionality principle for some kind of data, so say it was um, pairs, I'd just be saying something like that I know when two pairs are equal uh, because they're equal if their first components are equal and their second components are equal. Or if I have some, some functions, I know two functions are equal because they, they give me equal result types uh, for equal argument types when you apply the functions uh, and trees, et cetera, et cetera. So an extensionality principle is some logical principle that, that gives us a handle on how to reason about some type of data in terms of, of how the data is, is built up. So. Uh, what's an extensionality principle for a universe object? So in other words, how should we explain, uh, how could we fill in the question mark for if you've got two elements of the universe, uh, they're equal when what? We want to sort of explain that in terms of the, the structure that we have in, in terms of this family of, 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 of internal objects. So, so what, what should the... the you know, what's a reasonable thing to say here? Well, there are the first thing that you might think of um, is not very reasonable. You could just say, well, OK, I'll say that, that uh, why don't we look at universes where the codes are equal if they give me equal objects? That's not... I mean, it's possible to have examples of universes that satisfy that. If your, if your topos is the category of sets, then you, you can find universes that have that, that kind of strict principle. But in general, um, it's not mathematically very interesting, simply because um, the equality of objects isn't really uh, something that's going to be... Uh, a, a, it's going to be accidental, as it were, that two, two objects uh, are equal, and uh, much more mathematically interesting is when they're isomorphic. So you might think, well, why don't we uh, just relax a bit and, and say uh, uh, we'll look for a principle where, where the two codes are equal if they give you isomorphic objects. So that's a, that then is kind of too much the other way. It's, it's a far too strong kind of skeletal kind of property. Pretty hard to achieve that. And anyway, it doesn't really um, uh, get to the heart of the matter, which is that uh, 
you know, two given objects might be isomorphic in many different ways, and there'll be a, you know, a whole groupoid of, of uh, structure of, uh, for, for the isomorphisms that's not um, being built in, into this principle. So this, again, isn't going to be a, actually a very useful principle. And um, in the history of, of, of Martin Leff type theory, independent type theory, this is just this extensionality for universes. It's just not a question that was addressed, possibly, I think, because nobody could think of a useful answer uh, from uh, you know, the beginnings in, in the 1970s through, really, until till, uh, uh, you know, five or 10 years ago when homotopy type theory started to, to first rear its head. So uh, Vavodsky's univalence axiom is a nice answer to, to, the, uh, to the question of uh, what extensionality should mean, but it's, um, it, it involves us going down a road of slight complication, which I have to kind of, of, of try and uh, talk to you about. Um, so what we're going to do is, is um, get rid of the idea that we're trying to give an answer about when two codes are equal and replace that by a whole type. So we'll, we'll replace the actual um, judgment that two things are equal by um, uh, a type whose elements represent proofs that two things are equal. And, and the, this identity type, as I'll call it, uh, may have quite weak intentional aspects to it uh, compared with, with, with the, as it were, the actual external notion of equality. So we kind of weaken on the left-hand side uh, and similarly, on the right-hand side, instead of using isomorphism, we'll use a notion of equivalence, which is um, I'll briefly discuss, but it's defined in terms of identity types, and it's, it's uh, like isomorphism, but um, in the same way, it, you know, relates to, to uh, uh, isomorphism in the same way that equivalence of categories relates to, to isomorphism of categories. So it, it's a slightly more coherent version uh, of, of, uh, of isomorphism. And uh, the univalence axiom says that um, this type of, uh, uh, of proofs of identity is equivalent to the, uh, the type of, uh, of equivalences between the corresponding objects that are encoded by U and V. Uh, and so to say a universe is univalent is to say that we have a term of this type or a global element, if you like, of, of, of this type. So this turns out to be a very nice axiom that has lots of very interesting consequences for, for type theory, none of which uh, I am going to talk about in this talk. So I am going to take it as, as read that univalence is a useful thing to study. And what we're going to be doing is, is looking at ways in which uh, such universes can be uh, constructed or found. And uh, to uh, the, the sort of spoiler alert here, if you like, the answer is, Actually, unfortunately, it's rather difficult to find non-trivial examples of this phenomenon. I wish it were easier. Maybe it is and that we just haven't thought hard enough about it. But what I'm going to be showing you in the rest of this talk is, is uh, uh, a kind of axiomatic approach describing one way to arrive at, at uh, this kind of, of uh, extensionality principle for a, for a universe. OK, now, to do that, um, I'm going to, from now on, uh, make, com commit several sins, uh, one of which is that I, I won't really make much of a distinction between what's happening in a given topos and the internal language in which I describe what's happening. And that internal language, uh, unlike in David's talk, which was some sort of higher order predicate calculus with, with various um, um, uh, bells and whistles, as it were, the internal language here will be some sort of Martin Lerf type theory. And again, I, in fact, that would be probably annoyingly imprecise about exactly what it is. Uh, uh, but I'll use that type theoretic language to talk about what's happening in a particular topos. So in the type theory, we, we might have a, a context, so a list of assumptions that various variables have types, and the semantics of that will be an object of the topos. Um, uh, we might uh, have a type in some given context and the semantics of that is going to be an object over uh, the context. In other words, something in the slice top or so over this object. We might have a term uh, of some type, and that will be a global section of, of this object in the slice top or And then the various type theoretic constructs like dependent products, et cetera, et cetera, 
uh, correspond to, to various category theoretic things that you can do, like, like local exponentiation in the slices will be a way of, of doing pi types, etc. So that's one sin uh, uh, that I will confuse these two things, and it is a sin because unfortunately um, the relationship between these two things is not as straightforward as, as, as anybody would like. And um, it, it, it's far less straightforward than is the correspondence between, say, higher order predicate calculus and, and, and uh, uh, the elements uh, of the structure of a, of a topos. And part of that has to do with the nature of, of um, equality and, and, uh, and its behavior under substitution. So there are, there are subtle questions to do with, with uh, how you make this kind of language r really have a semantics in this kind of thing by, by being strict. Uh, uh, and I'm just not going to get into to any of that. And uh, if you don't know about it, then you don't need to worry about it. And if you do, then please forgive me for not, for not um, uh, um, being more precise than I am. Okay, so um, I want to explain this a little bit to you. So what have I got to do? We've got to talk about um, equivalence okay, between, between objects. And that's in turn in, is going to be described in terms of this notion of identity types. So the first thing I want to do is just to, to briefly say what I mean by uh, an identity type in, in, a, in a topos. Okay. And here um, uh, I can tell you about, um, as it were, kind of rather, I think, kind of modern view. So, I mean, if you go back to Martin Lurf, uh, uh, you'll find identity types in, in his uh, original work, uh, the, the sort of the intentional Martin Lurf type theory, for example. And um, uh, at the very base, what you want is some kind of type-forming operation. So, so the semantics of that will be, you know, if I've got two global sections of something in a slice, uh, I want to form an object in that slice that's going to represent proofs uh, of equality in, in some generalized sense that, that, that A and A prime are equal. So I, I will write identity types with a twiddles subscripted by the type at which we're talking about, and then I'll forget to write the subscript pretty much uh, from here on. Okay. What do we need of this? Well, there's a sort of introduction rule that says at the very least something, there should be a proof that, that something's equal to itself. And in Martin Lowe's approach, you take this formation rule and you take this introduction rule, and you, as we sort of see it from the point of view of modern times, is basically generate the rest automatically. So there's, a, there's a, an elimination rule and a computation rule that's kind of automatically generated from the form of, of these things. And I could tell you what those are, but I'm not going to, because um, uh, we can say some simpler things that pretty much capture in a slightly weaker sense, but not much weaker, uh, what's needed. They look a bit, well, one of them looks maybe a little bit special. Um, it says that if you have a proof that two things are equal, you should also have a proof that uh, the thing A and the uh, proof of reflexivity should be equal to A prime and P. So this is a, a proof in the identity type of this uh, uh, dependent sum. And uh, that has something to do with a kind of contractability property of equality. You can kind of slide a general uh, proof of equality P fixed at one end A back over to, to uh, uh, A and reflexivity. So it's a property that equality has. Uh, and another important property is that if you have a proof uh, that A equals A prime and you have some term of type B of A, B being some family that's uh, indexed by the... Uh, uh, terms of type A, then we should have some way of transporting that, uh, and I'll write that transport with, a, with an asterisk, uh, to a term of type A prime. So the interesting thing is that actually, in fact, if you have the stuff in the grey box here, that's enough, uh, and uh, uh, the more traditional uh, way of doing things, albeit in a propositional rather than a definitional way, so I won't bother to say what that means, but, but so just slightly weakened, but not really practically uh, weakened, follows from this, and it's um, uh, some of that uh, would be, if you knew about this already, slightly surprising, and otherwise um, maybe not. But, but that's, so this is what an identity type is going to be. It's something that satisfies uh, these, these rather straightforward properties. And we can always find one in a topos, but it's not a very useful one. So that the usual so-called extensional equality uh, would give us an identity type where you just say that the, uh, the, the object 
uh, of proofs that A equals A prime is just the subobject of one, the terminal object, uh, where those things are actually equal. Okay, so that's uh, the usual thing. So, so there's at most one, because this is the terminal object, there's at most one proof that two things are equal, and there is a proof when they are equal. So it's a very thin notion of, of identity type, and it's too thin for, for that to ever give us uh, a, a universe uh, satisfying univalence with respect to that notion of identity type. So there's actually, in fact, uh, you know, a fairly straightforward theorem that, that if you define identity types like this, then uh, the negation of univalence holds. Um, so, so, in other words, the universe is definitely not univalent. So to get models of univalence, we have to, to look at more relaxed, fatter, if you like, uh, notions of, of identity type. So, so more intentional uh, notions of, 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 of what equality means. Uh, in order that that then coincide with, with equivalence uh, in the way that univalence tells us. So where, where do we find such things? And that's, that's one of the things that the so-called uh, homotopical view of, 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 uh, of type theory, in, in particular of identity types, uh, has played a very strong role. So that view is simply that um, you should think in type theory that a type is some kind of generalized space, and therefore that the terms of that type are somehow points. And then crucially, if I have a proof that two things are equal, uh, it's useful to think of that as analogous to a path between the two points. So then a, a proof between two proofs uh, that two things are equal would be analogous to a homotopy uh, b between the two paths, etc., etc. So that's proved to be... Um, uh, a very useful way of thinking about the nature of equality in type theory. And in particular, you can instantiate this precisely if you, if you work in the topos of simplicial sets, that's a particular pre-sheaf topos. Um, then Vavodsky showed and other people helped him to, to, to uh, uh, hone that proof that uh, there is a universe object uh, in, in the topos of simplicial sets which satisfies the univalence axiom and is highly non-trivial, uh, so that the identity types never um, um, truncate, for example. Uh, and this, this is, um, you, you're building your, your model of type theory not, not just from the pre-sheaves, but you have to cut down to, as it were, good pre-sheaves, and, and one uses the, the, the uh, existing notion of can completeness uh, and uh, can fibration and so on to, to build that. So I'm not going to be talking about that model uh, in this talk. I want to talk instead about something that came along later, uh, which is a... Um, so Vavodsky's model uh, it can be shown to work, but only within classical mathematics. So it uses things like inaccessible cardinals. It certainly uses the law of excluded middle and so on. It uses the theory of minimal vibrations and so on and so forth. Um, so what was interesting is, is that in, in about 2015, uh, um, Thierry Coquin and his co-workers uh, came up with a constructive uh, model of the univalence axiom, still using a pre sheaf topos, at this time not of simplicial sets, but of a particular sort of so-called cubical set. And they showed that if you work constructively, you know, let, let's say within intuitionistic zamello franknell set theory, um, not that every constructivist would say that was constructive, but... Uh, um, so that's, uh, you, can, you can work there if you like. Um, you get a, a, a model of univalence. And uh, since then, there have been lots of variations on the notion of cubical set uh, and uh, uh, univalent universes in them. So the work that I want to describe in the rest of this talk is, is basically to pull out from that uh, some axioms that you can state within the internal language of a, of a topos, if that language is taken to be some sort of dependent type theory, which allow you to, to do this constructive uh, construction of a universe in the topos that, that, that has the univalence property. And this is where intervals come in. So you could say that, that what we're going to do is the following. Uh, let's, we're in some topos E, okay, and let's suppose that we have an object, a uh, bold I, uh, that has a pair of global elements, which I'll call 0 and 1. And I want to think of that as somehow being an interval. Okay, so 0 is the beginning of the interval and 1 is the, the end of the interval. And I'd like 
to take the homotopical view of type theory, which says that proofs of equality are paths, absolutely literally in this topos, and say that, a, that a, a proof of equality is going to be a path out of I. So, so if I'm looking into equality in object A, I'll look at the exponential A to the I, so that's the set of functions uh, from I to A, and uh, look at the subobjects of those functions where at zero you get A and at one you get A prime. Okay, so that's a particular um, object in the topos, uh, and we'll take that to be the, the, um, the identity type uh, that we're get, going to work with. So the question then becomes, what do we need to know about the topos and the interval object that it contains in order that this is a, a, a sensible notion of identity type, satisfies those, those axioms I had a few slides before. That's not so easy, uh, not so difficult to, to uh, pin down, but we all then want to go on and construct a univalent universe based on that notion of identity type. And I'll, I'll show you what, what we, we know about answering this question. Well, first of all, does this give a, a, a useful notion of identity type? So it has to satisfy the reflexivity, the contraction property, and the, the um, uh, tra uh, transport uh, property. Well, reflexivity is, is easy, right? Because if you just take the constant function on A, that's going to be um, uh, a path from A to A in this sense of path. So, so that's automatic uh, that we have a reflexivity. You'll get the contraction property as long as the interval comes along with some weak notion of, of minimum. Okay, so it's, it's a binary uh, operation on the interval um, that doesn't have to really satisfy very much. Thing, things like uh, zero uh, min i should be equal to zero, one min i should be equal to i, uh, and similarly uh, um, um, some, some dual properties as well. So I, I won't... I won't spell out the exact axioms. But once you have that, then the contraction uh, can be given in a very straightforward way. So we're, we're moving uh, as i goes from 0 to 1. This goes from uh, uh, um, p of 0 to, to p of 1. So you get the path p in the first component. So you sort of go from a to a prime in the first component. And in the second component, if you think about this and you work out what properties the connection has to have, we'll start with something which is constantly p of 0 uh, and end up when i is 1 with something which is uh, extensionally the same as, as the function uh, lambda j, p of j, just p again. So, so we, get, uh, we get the thing. So, so the, the message is that, that it's not very difficult. You don't have to impose very many conditions on an interval in order to get those two things. The problem really lies with transport. So there's no reason on earth why this notion should, should come and give you uh, a, a family of functions like this for any, any old family of, uh, uh, of objects uh, uh, over A. Okay. So, um, so what we're going to do then is, is <coughs> make transport work by essentially putting some extra structure on the notion of family so that part of that extra structure will enable us to do transport. So we change the notion of family in order to make transport work. Uh, and, and in that way, this definition then will give us uh, a, a, a correct uh, notion of identity type, at least. It, w it won't, uh, up to that point, give us univalence, but, but, but at least we will have got that far. So, um, so the, the extra structure, uh, I'll just call a fibration. So there are lots of different notions of fibration. So this is the one that's coming out of the work of these four guys. Uh, okay, and, it, and it's... Um, to do that, we need to have not just an interval around, but we need to have some other uh, assumptions about the topos. And, and um, what we need is, is the, the analog of, of um, the notion of can filling, so uh, can completeness and can fibration, etc. And the way that I'll do that is I'm just going to assume that... Um, so omega is the subobject classifier of our topos. I'm going to assume that we have a subobject of omega, so a set of propositions, as it were, sub, uh, an object of propositions, uh, which contain true. Okay, so, so this one to cough is the factorization of, of true through, through this. And uh, cough stands for cofibrant proposition. And we're going to assume some properties of cofibrant uh, propositions as we, as we go along. Okay, so that, that's, we're going to have this extra structure. But if you give me that extra structure, then the notion of 
of vibration is, well, it looks a bit scary, but it's actually, um, believe me, a heck of a lot easier to understand on this slide than it would be in the original uh, version. Uh, it's a, um, so if I have a family of types, okay, and, I, and I'll now um, look at types valued in one of these size universes, so I'm looking at families of a particular size, if you like. So, so given a family, I want to put a vibration structure on it. What is that going to be? It's a function which, if you give me a path in the base gamma and a partial path upstairs, okay, so, so this is a, um, a partial function that's giving you something in, in A of PI uh, for each uh, element of the interval, but it's a, it's a partial element, okay, so, so it's uh, with respect to some cofibrant uh, proposition, okay, and what we want uh, is to know that at zero, that partial element extends to some total element. So, so my up arrow is just, um, it's this type, but you can just say it's, it's the type uh, of proofs that F agrees with X where it's defined. So if you give me a path downstairs, a partial co with path with cofibrant domain, and a way of extending at zero, then the vibration structure just gives you a way of extending at one. It's actually not really a lifting property so much as a kind of transport from zero to one kind of property. So that's a, um, a nice, turns out to be a very nice definition that has lots of very good properties. And that's, that's their notion of vibration, except it, it's their notion once you've, you've translated it in, into this type theoretic language, which uh, makes it easier to understand what's going on. So uh, in particular, um, we're going to assume that, that the, the proposition false, so, so the empty set, if you like, is cofibrant. And so I can apply this where phi is false, so where this is basically, uh, therefore, there's only a unique, totally undefined uh, partial function, uh, and extension is trivial. So this is just telling me if I've got an A0, I get an A1. So the sort of uh, instantiating phi to be false, we do get transport functions uh, out, out, of, out of such a thing. So that this notion of vibration certainly gives you a notion of transport, uh, but the nice thing about it is it doesn't just do that, but it, it's sufficiently well behaved that you can show that uh, if you have a vibration on a family and you take a pi type or a sigma type, then you'll get a vibration on the corresponding uh, pi type or sigma type. Similarly, uh, you can put vibration structure on, on families of path types. In fact, you get, if you look at uh, families equipped with vibrations, you get a nice model of of the sort of non-universe part of, of uh, Martin Lerf type theory. So that's all well and good, but, but what we're after is, is to have a universe and to see that it's univalent. So how do we get a universe of, of vibrations um, out of this? So that's where the, the property of tininess uh, comes in. So I, I, I think I'm right in saying that, that, that uh, tiny intervals were considered in first uh, in the context of a sort of synthetic approach to differential geometry, um, where, where you're, you're looking at a, a sort of in infinitesimally sized little interval uh, uh, when, you're, when you're considering things like differentiation and so on. Here we're going to use it for a very different purpose, but just as a piece of category theory, what tininess means is that the exponential functor, so raised to the power i, uh, should have a, a, a right adjoint. Because it always has a left adjoint, that's product with i. Uh, and if you take the exponential with respect to some arbitrary object, you don't expect that exponential function normally to have a further right adjoint. It's a very peculiar uh, property to have a, a further right adjoint. I'll, I'll write that right adjoint using this um, square root sign. Okay. Um, and. Uh, I'll, I'll give you an example of a whole family of tiny objects in, in a moment. But the theorem is uh, that, that if you're doing this notion of vibration uh, with respect to an interval object which is tiny, then actually the, the functor that assigns to each object its set of families with a vibration structure actually is a representable functor. So there's a, there's a generic vibration. And uh, from that, we get a universe of, of, of vibrations. And we'll see with just a couple of extra uh, more axioms that that universe will turn out to be univalent. Where, where do tiny things come from? Well, well they're certainly there in lots of uh, pre-sheaf toposes. 
So the original um, model of, of uh, Cochin and Cohen and Huber and Mortberg, it's a pre sheaf topos, so sets to the um, C op, as it were, where C is a particular category which I'll write as box. Never mind exactly what that category is, but, but it is actually a category with finite products, so it's a Lorvier theory. And it's the having the finite products which is enough for us here, uh, plus the fact that the interval object is, is actually a representable. Uh, so it, it's represented by some object uh, I in, in box. So if you're in the situation where you are in pre-sheaves on a, on a little category with finite products and you're, you're, you, the object you're interested in is a representable on one of those objects, then you, you exponentiation with respect to, to that representable does have a further right adjoint. That's simply because if you think about it, exponentiation to the I from this pre sheaf category to itself. That's isomorphic just to pre-compose with uh, the, the functor from box to box, which is product with, with the object I. Um, Pre-composition with respect to, to a, a functor, that's always got both left and right adjoints, right? Left can extension and right can extension. So in particular, oops, uh, we have a right adjoint uh, to, to this thing, so we have a right adjoint to exponentiation. So, so I is, is tiny in that case. So there are, there are lots of tiny objects in, in, uh, in pre-sheaf toposes coming from, from representables. And the interval that CCHM we're actually using is, is, is of that nature. So this theorem can be instantiated to, to their particular pre-sheaf topos to get, to get uh, the universe, in fact, that, that, that they uh, show directly uh, is, is univa univalent. So I just want to, I want to, um, I'm not going to prove very much in this talk, but I thought since this, um, this theorem actually is a pretty straightforward piece of category theory, I'm going to whiz it in front of you rather too quickly, uh, but at least to show you that it is really, uh, unlike some of the other theorems I'm going to state in a moment, this one is not very difficult, uh, and it's just really a diagram chase. So what, what we want to do is we want to construct, uh, uh, you know, to, to, to say this functor is representable, let me translate what that's saying is that we have a particular object U, so that's going to be the thing that represents script F, uh, and uh, an element of F of U, so that's going to be a family, which I'll call pi 1, and a fibration structure on pi 1. And it's generic in the sense that if I start in some other object gamma with a family A and a fibration structure, there's a unique morphism from gamma to U, which I'll write like this, that gives you back this vibration a and alpha from the generic one by re-indexing. So I, d I didn't say how script F is a functor, but it's, um, it's not very uh, uh, difficult to, to, to see that it is. So, so that's, that's what we'd like to construct, is, is a particular object U with a particular vibration that gives every other one by, by, uh, by basically uh, re-indexing, a kind of pullback. And actually, it's pretty easy to do that. So let, let me just show you quickly how that goes. So if one stares at the definition of CCH fi uh, CCHM fibration, uh, one sees that actually uh, if I've got such a fibration alpha, fibration structure alpha on a family A, uh, what you have is a diagram that looks like this. So you have the, the size universe S displayed here, and uh, you have a particular morphism coming in from paths in the universe. So I won't want C is sort of composition structures, but, but uh, never mind exactly what it is. Uh, and so to be a fibration structure is exactly to be an alpha that fits into a picture uh, that makes this commute. But you see, the point about that is that we're looking at something from S to the I into S. So it's crying out once we know that, that to the I has a right adjoint for us to flip this whole diagram over the adjunction. So we could do that, uh, transposing over the adjunction, and we'll get a commutative diagram that looks like this. Okay. So now here we have the original family A, and we're coming into this this... Uh, thing where I've done the right adjoint to the displayed uh, size universe. Uh, well, why did I write uh, a gap here? Because I'm going to take a pullback. Right? So I take a pullback here. Okay. So now, obviously, this outer square is going to factor uh, through that, that inner one. And um, that actually is going to be the, the, uh, the morphism that we want that's naming in, in the universe of vibrations the particular vibration A and alpha. And why is that? Well, if I take this diagram and flick it back over the adjunction, so I do that like this, then on the outside, I've got my original square, which just corresponds to having a vibration. But on the inside, I, I, I've got 
this picture, and if one analyzes this is something into this displayed thing, it has to be of the form uh, that bottom composite and something, and that something by definition is a fibration structure. And that gives us the generic, that, that gives us the, the, the fibration structure on, on, um, on this family. The, the U and the pi 1 is just the, the uh, oops, sorry, pi 1 is just here. You see, we have this family got by pullback. And the fact that the upper triangle commutes is just telling us that, that uh, uh, when we uh, re index pi 1 and, 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 and nu uh, along uh, this morphism, we get back the original alpha. So it's, a, it's a actually a pretty straightforward um, um, thing. What was not so straightforward was to see that, that, that the definitions of vibrations could be uh, massaged into the form that makes this argument work. Uh, also not so hard is, is that now we've got, well, uh, we get a universe, right, because we can take the size universe and we've got this um, uh, family, uh, 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 we've got our, our, our u and a, a pi 1. If we just pull back, we get a universe object like this. So that's sort of, sort of saying we'll take u and its generalized elements and we'll just uh, we'll look at it as a, as a universe just by, so it's like uh, the universe of vibration structures and to see what type is, uh, such a thing has. We'll just forget the vibration structure and remember the family. So that's essentially what the pullback does. Yeah. Yes. yes. As, as, as I said, I mean, I'm, I'm in, a, in a, a world where I have a topos with a sequence of universes, S0, S1. So, so my script S there, sorry, I should have said, is one of the SIs, right. one of the SNs. So, but, but the S's, they are universes, so they each, they each have a display. So this is, this, this is the display for... What, what properties do they lack that you know they... Well, okay, so they're, 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 they're universes that are closed under the type theory, theoretic operations, right? Um, but they don't... Um, uh, um, And they would also be closed under, under that particular notion of identity, but they won't be univalent, okay? And the reason is because the axioms for being an identity type are sufficiently strong that if you've got two different instantiations of them, they won't be the same, but they will be equivalent to each other. So within the universe script S, you can prove that, that, that uh, m the path types I'm talking about are logically equivalent to the extensional identity type that I mentioned, and we know that that satisfies not univalence. So I know very strongly that this is not a univalent universe. Magically, when I do this pullback, uh, I, I get a universe that, which is still closed under all the pi types, the sigma types, has the path types in it, but now it will satisfy univalence in a moment. I still have one more thing to assume before it does. So it doesn't at the moment, but it is in a, it's going to in a second. Okay. What we do get, though, is, is it's a universe closed under the kind of things we want. So it's closed under pi types, closed under path types, inductive types like sigma types and other, other inductive definitions. So long as uh, our notion of cofibrant proposition has a few properties. I was already assuming that falsity was cofibrant. We need to also assume that, that cofibrancy is closed under disjunction with endpoints. So if you know that phi is cofibrant, I'd also want to know that, that phi or i equals zero, i is a variable of the interval type, is cofibrant and similarly there. So the, these are uh, properties that we're going to assume that cofibrancy satisfies. But uh, we get a universe, it's closed under nice things, but is it univalent? Okay. Um, let me just uh, write. Um, Olivia, how, how long do I have? Okay, probably just a bit. Yeah. But whilst it says I only have a 18 slides, that's a bit of a lie. Um, um, <laughs> yeah. I haven't really told you, uh, I mean, I, I wrote up what univalence meant, but I didn't really tell you what equivalence was. I, l l let's just wind back a, a moment and, 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 uh, and say what that is. Uh, I mean, again, this is probably, if you've never seen it for the first time, it's probably not going to help that much, but at least I'll feel less guilty about not having told you the definition properly. So one of, one of Vodsky's nice insights, right, is, is uh, about this viewpoint of a homotopical view of type theory is, is that the, the notion of contractibility, so a space is contractible if it has a point, 
and every other point, there's a path to, the, to that center point, okay? is a really useful organizing notion in, in, in logic, in type theory. So being contractible is, says, you know, there exists a, a point in A so that for all other points uh, you have a proof that they're equal. So it's just a type. Okay, and then we can say precisely what it means to be contractible. One way of doing it is just to say that uh, a, a morphism f from A to B is contractible if for everything in, in the base B, uh, the fiber over little b is a contractible uh, type. And then two things are equivalent if there is an equivalence uh, structure, if there is a morphism and an equivalent structure uh, for them. And then univalence, to be precise about it, that I wasn't precise about it before, is the statement that the canonical, there is a canonical morphism that takes a, an identity proof from U and V and gives you an equivalence between the, the object coded by U and the object coded by V. So we always have that if we have a notion of equivalence around. What univalence asks is that that canonical morphism uh, have uh, an equivalent structure on it. So there is some equivalent structure on that. So it's not that, that there's some arbitrary equivalence between left and right-hand side, but the, the canonical function is, is an equivalence, is the precise uh, statement. So we're looking for uh, a, a term of type UA for, for the universe U and DL, for, for the universe that we just constructed here. So EL is the, the, the morphism I didn't write there. Okay. Yeah. Nope, nope, no, 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 no. So these are good old sigmas. You actually have a witness of things, and yeah. Pro propositional truncation is playing a strong role, but I'm suppressing it. Uh, the role it's playing is, is, is uh, actually what did I mean by or here? Um, uh, and that's, that's where the, you have to be careful. But it, or you could just say it just means or in the usual topos theoretic sense, but, but uh, from type theory, you have to be careful. So the, the main theorem is the following. Uh, and I've just got <laughs> enough time to state it and then wind up. Um, so um, if we assume everything that we've assumed so far, so we have this topos with these size universes, we have an interval object, and we have some notion of co proposition that satisfies those rather straightforward things. Okay, we construct this universe of CCHM vibrations, then the theorem is that, that it is univalent, and actually the object itself is is vibrant over the terminal object, which is also important. As long as, well, one extra closure property on co-vibrant things is that they be closed under universal quantification over interval indexed things. But also, uh, this so-called isomorphism extension axiom has to hold as well. And um, unlike previous theorems, this is not a straightforward theorem to prove. So there's a lot of hard work involved and I'll come back to that right at the end. Just want to say what the isomorphism extension theorem is. Forget about the symbols, look at the pictures, okay? It's, it says that we should know the following. If you've got um, some family of types and you restrict it to a, a, a sub-object which is co-fibrant, okay, and you have a family which is isomorphic to the original thing, so, so subfamily B, which is isomorphic, in the usual sense of isomorphism in a, in a topos, with the restricted family, then it should be the case that you can correct A to an A prime up to isomorphism so that when you restrict that A prime, you actually get B up to equality. It is what it is, okay? And if you've never seen it before, then it's impossible, I think, to, to judge whether that's a, a strong requirement or a weak requirement. Turns out it's a very weak requirement in some senses because in pre-sheaved toposes, it's always true, uh, classically, and even, even constructively. So if you work in some set theory which has not got the law of excluded middle, as long as your co-fibrant proposition, so they're going to be sieves, if you know what that is, uh, and uh, as long as uh, membership in a co-fibrant sieve, as long as that's decidable, you, are, you either know you're in it or you're not for some morphism coming into X. If that's true, then actually this this isomorphism extension axiom is provable. So, so in classical uh, meta theory, uh, this is always, these things are always decidable, so you always have a term of this kind. So it's actually not a, re not a, a restriction at all uh, classically, but it is constructively. And um, in the constructive model that these four guys 
did. They, they carefully chose a particular class of co-fibrant propositions that, that turned out to have this property, not that it was stated explicitly uh, like that. So just to, to summarize then, that, that these are the assumptions. To top off with, with size universes, you have an interval object that, that has a connection and uh, actually convenience to also assume it has some kind of reversal operation as well, but crucially, which is tiny, and you have this notion of cofibrant proposition that satisfies some pretty anodyne uh, closer conditions and, and this, this extension axiom that turns out, at least in pre to not be uh, particularly uh, difficult. And, and, and in that case, you get a univalent universe. Yeah. No, it, so, so, so um, uh, uh, it means that the, the false proposition is in COF. So if you, if you think you, ha you have a global section of omega which is false, like you have one which is true, yeah. Yes, that's right. Sorry, yes. Yes, that's right. So if you, if you think of the cofibrant things as a class of monomorphisms, then, then the, the empty sub-object is always cofibrant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And being closed under for all is the same as just saying if I have a mono which is cofibrant and I exponentiate by I, then it's still cofibrant actually. So, yeah. So um, I just want to conclude then. So, so um, you've never seen these, this stuff before, then you don't appreciate how easy I have made it for you. Right? So if you read the original paper about, about, uh, by, by those four guys about, about this particular univalent universe, it, it's a marvelous paper, it's a fantastic paper, tons of stuff in it, implicitly and explicitly, but, um, but working out all the details is quite hard work. This axiomatic approach, um, using this internal language uh, of type theory and a topos makes some things much easier. Secretly, why things are easy? One reason is because, um, compared, say, with, with trying to do the same thing for simplicial sets, is that I'm taking my path types to be all functions from, from some interval object. So it's a sort of Cartesian notion of, of path functor. And uh, exponentiation to the i, it's not just a functor on the topos to itself, it's actually a fibered functor, right? So it lives in the slices as well. So I can use internal language to talk about paths where I'm quantifying over statements where you have, as it were, implicitly free variables of other kinds of things, and everything works out nicely. And I, I, that's partly why it's, it, it, it's easy. Unfortunately, not everything I'm using has that property. So in particular, the right adjoint to exponentiation, that square root functor, that's not fibered. It can't be uh, in non-trivial uh, cases. It can't be fibered. In other words, you, you can't uh, work slice-wise with that right adjoint. Um, and uh, so t tininess doesn't internalize, and therefore actually the universe construction uh, can't be stated just in the internal language uh, uh, of a topos. The way that, that, that uh, I and uh, my collaborators, one of whom is in the audience, I'm pleased to say, one of whom is my PhD student, and Dan Licata, who's sitting somewhere in the US at the moment, I guess, um, what we do is we, we still want to use an internal language to describe everything because it, it's really nice. Um, and uh, so we, we use a, a modal type theory. So we have a modality that expresses that something is a global element rather than a local element. Uh, so amusingly called crisp type theory. I didn't make that name up, so don't shoot me. Um, and that can express everything within a kind of in, uh, type theoretic language. But I'm not going to tell you about that. So what I would say is that the axiomatic approach is it really helps you see the wood from the trees, if you know that English expression, in, in the existing models. And it, it might actually help to find new ones. So, for example, there's a recent paper of uh, uh, Uemura, um, which I think is appearing in, in Licks probably uh, uh, in a couple of weeks' time, where he takes our ideas and applies them to the effective topos. So it's not even a growth unique topos to construct um, a, a kind of cubical uh, model, but a new one. Uh, which is which is univalent, so that's that's nice. On the other hand, um, there's no free lunch here. Some you do have to do hard work to get uh, uh, univalence. So we, we actually make essential use, I would say, of, a, of, a, of an interactive theorem prover to make sure we don't make mistakes. The one we use is is a, a version of, of the prover Agda for, from Gothenburg. Uh, it has to be sort of extended in order to. Do cope with crisp type theory, but uh, uh, the, the Vozzi 
did that for us. And so you can see a formal development of a lot of what I've talked about uh, here, for example, uh, if, you, if, you, if you like that kind of thing. Um, but I guess my main conclusion is, is one of slight frustration, actually, because um, uh, though I've tried as hard as I can to, to make the description of these kind of univalent universes dead simple, the fact is, in the end, they're not. And, and I've hidden from you, as it were, a lot of quite hard work that has to be done. And I don't really see why uh, it has to be so hard. So I, I'm really in the market for other models. I would like simpler models. To be interesting, they have to be universes in which there's no truncation, in the sense that if you keep on iterating the, the identity types, you look at proofs of proofs of proofs of equality, you, you want to have instances where that never truncates and all proofs become equal. So it's sort of like saying you want to have spaces that, that have potentially um, non-trivial homotopy types uh, for, for any n. Um, and I, I would, you know, one way of making it simpler would be to ditch the whole can filling idea and use some notion of path composition. And I've tried very hard to do that, and I have to say I've singularly failed at the moment. And the other thing I don't really understand is why all of the examples that we know of at the moment, from Grothendieck pursuing his stacks onwards, really, have all been pre sheaf toposes. And there's a lovely world of sheaf toposes out there where intervals can have really fantastically useful properties, some of which I've tried to use, but nobody so far has managed to push that through uh, to actually constructing univalent universes. So on that slightly down note, I'll stop and thank you for your attention.